Hello, hello, hello. Good to see you, Ben. Hi, Ted. Good to see you too. Yeah. So uh, we're going to uh, kind of just go over um, sort of a CNCF update uh, based on uh, what we saw when we were at KubeCon. And of course, because we're observability geeks, we're going to do it from the perspective of observability and open telemetry in particular. Uh, so I thought uh, kind of a, a fun way to do it would be to, to sort of do a little quadrant plot here um, for our audience, uh, the vertical axis is, you know, how, how novel uh, was this announcement or update uh, versus it being maybe kind of boring um, or nothing new, but actually still really important. And then the left right axis is sort of how relevant is this announcement to the open telemetry roadmap. This isn't like how important or not important it is just, you know, relative to open telemetry. So how's that sound to you? I like it. I would say, you know, I've every time I've gone to KubeCon, it's been fun. Uh, and yeah. also it's been uh, apparent that there's like a strong newness bias. So I like the vertical axis uh, as a way to remind ourselves, especially the button important at the bottom. Like there's there's not like always a lot of interest in things that actually are, you know, pretty critical, but aren't newsworthy at some level like uh, so I I like this I think it's good just to help awesome. keep us keep us honest yeah and actually um uh our first point on the plot is is so off-road and so novel it's not even on the screen but while we were at KubeCon I got to go to a Red Wings game since we were in Detroit which is actually I think the first time I've seen professional hockey in person and it was a lot of fun even though the Red Wings got absolutely thrashed by New Jersey Hockey is kind of fun. It's like condoned violence, um, you know, but very graceful at the same time. Uh, and yeah. uh, I don't know, it's just bad for TV. So no one watches it, but it's, yeah, it's pretty fun. Yeah, I dug it. But uh, slightly more relevant, um, our, our first item is uh, Hotel Unplugged. So this was like our community open telemetry day that we had as kind of a zero day at KubeCon. And um, we, we had a lot of attendees. It, it was really good. And we did kind of like a lot of road mapping to see what was was interesting to the community and get a lot of feedback from people. Um, we did a bunch of breakout sessions. It was really fun. So this is maybe more of an announcement. But yeah, Ben, do you have thoughts? Well, I was going to ask you, like, you know, what do you what what, and what was your take on the um like what were the main themes from people who were end users of Otel uh, who were there, right? Because I think Otel, it's an interesting project. It's like a ton of velocity and a lot of committers and a lot of people who are involved in the project, the people who are actually making a lot, who are working at Otel more or less 24 seven, mostly work for vendors. And one of the things that's nice about KubeCon is that it's a chance to kind of get physically in a room with people who are on the end user side. And I was curious for your take on the, the themes from an end user standpoint. Yeah, uh, it, it was validating in the sense that what what people were asking for is is pretty similar to our existing roadmap. You know, we do have like an end user working group with an open telemetry now for interviewing end users and kind of making sure. But uh, the main themes is there's there's more and more people showing up who are using open telemetry in production. Uh, people were showing up kind of doing novel things with it. So people are using it enough that they're building systems on top of it. Uh, we definitely heard from a number of end, end users who are building kind of like uh, high level like business analytics on top of open telemetry, which I thought was really cool. Um, and uh, the stuff people want, uh, there's big, a lot of interest in RUM or client client side telemetry, so browser and, and mobile telemetry, which is the thing we're working on. And uh, people were very excited about uh, op amp, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, people also very excited about a query language. I don't think we actually have a query language on the roadmap here because it is not something that was announced at KubeCon because it's not something that exists yet. But I thought it was uh, this is maybe, I'm actually interested to hear your thoughts about this, Ben. We, you know, we've been kicking around this idea of like, we've standardized telemetry, but the other side that's not standardized is 
is how do you query the data? Um, there's no standard query language. And a lot of people are asking for it, but for, for different reasons with different ideas about what, what it might be. So what, what do you think? About yeah, that? I think, yeah, the query language is like the third rail. <laughs> I do have feelings about this. I'll call them feelings almost first and thought second. Um, I get it. I get why people want that for sure as a thing. And I mean, you know this, Ted, because uh, we talked about it, but like, I actually think it's a really good idea to have some sort of, you know, hotel like project that's more devoted to queries or analytics, I guess, on the data. The concern I have about it is twofold. One um, is that hotel, uh, if you had to say whether, I mean, nothing can be perfect. If it was either too wide or too narrow, I'd say Otel today feels almost too wide as is, right? It's like the, the project is thriving in a way, but like we're still not there yet on, on kind of meeting or exceeding the, the level, the ease of adoption of a proprietary agent, you know, which I think is basically the, the bar, right? To, yeah. to be set just for getting the telemetry out. And yet, you know, there's, I, I think it totally makes sense and does, it should be in scope for Otel, but things like ROM and profiling and stuff like that are kind of like diverting our focus from that initial objective, I think, of just making telemetry built in, high quality telemetry built in. So I, from a scope standpoint, it kind of freaks me out. But the other piece, which I, I think is more fundamental, like even if we had infinite resources and stuff, I still don't think we should have an analytical query language built into Otel. I think I made some comment about TT, the, what's now called the um, Otel uh, telemetry transformation language, which is in the collector. It's more of just like a, you know, it's it's just like stream processing, munging data from one format to another kind of thing. Like that, I think makes sense. But but if we start getting into the realm of actually analyzing the telemetry, we're going to get very close to the use cases for. Um, uh, like actual observability. And I've always thought of the telemetry as the base layer of extraction, and then there's like durable storage, and then there are all these use cases above it. And if we bring those use cases in, we're not far from having Otel become like an observability, like full stack observability project, which I do not think is a good idea as, as one project. It's, it's, going to, um, it's going to get very monolithic if it isn't already. And, yeah. and uh, the only thing that gives me pause about this is that um, the elephant in the room for a lot of end users around uh, observability in general is that most of the telemetry data is never used for any purpose ever. And yet, you know, you're paying a cost to instrument it. And then of course, to send it over the network and store it. And, and to fix that, to really close that loop does require some kind of feedback mechanism between the usage of the telemetry and the instrumentation side of it. Um, yeah. The query language, uh, you know, if combined with config as code and a bunch of other things could be a really important piece of building that feedback mechanism. So I recognize that, but I still don't, even if you believe that, I, I don't think it requires, like, a, I don't think it requires that that project be part of Otel. Um, anyway, the, the TC I think had a ruling <laughs> about this recently, right? Uh, there was like a issue where this was discussed just straight up. And I think the decision by the TC and I think ratified at the GC level is like that we don't want to bring this in scope for now, but uh, yeah. in hotel, but I do think it's an awesome idea and I'm actually a champion of it as an idea. I just don't, I don't think it's going to be good for hotel long-term to expand into the analytical side. Yeah, I totally agree. We won it for various projects around open telemetry, but they're kind of like weird maybe weird is not quite the word, but they're they're like edge casey projects. And as soon as you say you have a query language, people are going to assume you have a database and a storage layer and right. dashboards and all of these things that we are super duper not interested in Yeah, um, because you can't standardize that stuff. Yeah, But you did have a good point um, around a feedback mechanism, which gets to probably the most popular topic that showed up uh, at Hotel Unplugged, which is OpAmp. So for the people who don't know, OpAmp is a protocol we are working on for building a control plane uh, for the open telemetry collectors and clients. So this is a way some centralized uh, controller could push out uh, rules and configuration changes um, to all of these um, observability pipeline uh, components. 
without needing to restart them. And so, Ben, yeah, what what gets you excited about this? Where do you see the the, the big wins here? Yeah, I mean, I, I do think it's really important. Um, uh, I, I it does have a lot to do with the stuff I was just saying a minute ago, right? Like, I, um, this idea of of there being like a um, some kind of static fixed set of like the correct telemetry for any particular piece of software is a total misnomer, uh, especially when you're dealing with um, with software that can be, you know, reused and um, uh, and embedded at different layers of the stack for different purposes. Like you might want very different verbosity levels for different for different deployments of the same piece of code, for instance. And uh, and opamp is um, on the critical path to fixing that in a principled way. Um, so I, I think it's um, one of the most important projects in Otel and that it allows us to get line of sight to solving the feedback loop problem I was talking about earlier without becoming proprietary or or bringing in too many vendor specific primitives. I mean, Lightstep has been, you know, pretty involved with this, but we're working yeah. with a bunch of other vendors, which I think is important, right? Like just to make sure that it doesn't end up being um, like a uh, just a thin veneer over some vendors' particular requirements. So I, I do think this is really important to address that ROI issue for telemetry, among other things. Yeah, and just to maybe make a little more concrete for our audience, like, do you mind touching on sampling here? Because I think there's a lot of things you can control, but controlling sampling, quote unquote, uh, is uh, probably the most important. Uh, I'm not sure if you agree with that. No, I think that's... Um... Yeah, I mean, I think that's the the first priority. Um, so yeah, in that sense, I think it's most important right now. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, it's pretty simple, really. It's like if you try and um, if you try and capture um, every detail of every transaction flowing through a system all the time, and you are running it, you know, kind of planet scale workloads. It's not that you can't do it. I think it's actually it. It's a it's a misnomer to say that it's going to affect performance necessarily of your application, but it's just really expensive, and so yeah. you end up looking at what you're paying to just transit all that data to your durable store, whatever that is, whether it's a vendor or not, and it's probably not worth it. And so the natural thing to do at that point is to say, well, let's not keep all of it. So you sample on a transaction level, so you keep some of the transactions, you discard the rest. Um, the Dapper paper that you know I helped work on at Google, the sampling rates very low. It was like we kept one out of 1,024 traces and then we did another 10X cut before we did the global. So it was like really one in 10,000 transactions was actually globally durably stored centrally, which is like fine actually for web search or something like that, where you had some God knows how many queries per second, but it's not fine at all for a low traffic service. And so you end up in this predicament where in order to make the, if you're gonna do kind of global sampling, you you know, you're forced to these really low sampling rates and then your low traffic services become invisible. Um, so something like OpAmp allows for sampling to be more dynamic uh, and you can have, you know, different sampling rates at different points in the stack and have that controlled in a way that's, again, you know, um, vendor neutral and, um, and portable. Um, that's the kind of short version. As, a, as long as I'm talking, I will say, I personally wish that there was that we were a little further along the sampling thing so we could move to the next step, which is controlling verbosity as well. Like in, in a perfect world, different transactions aren't just sampled yes or no, but you have this whole spectrum of verbosity from like we propagate context to we keep track of like the basic, basic method calls to we keep attributes to we store like a detailed log to, you know, maybe one in a million transactions you record like every function call or something like that. Like it would be yes. so powerful to have once an hour, just an absolutely fine-grained capture everything transaction trace. And there's no real reason we can't do that other than that we just haven't implemented it yet. Um, but but verbosity and sampling need to go hand in hand. And you know, we're we're still getting to the point where we're just getting basic dynamic sampling implemented, which is hard. But as soon as we do, OpAmp could also be helpful for controlling sampling and verbosity as a pair, which I think is actually pretty exciting um so anyway yeah no i i totally agree with that and um i, I think yeah the one 
bit of color I would add there is like people often ask me, it's like, well, what is the correct sampling level? And, right. you know, the, the answer is always like, well, it a hundred percent depends on what you're doing with the data, right? Like different techniques require different, different volumes of data, um, different sampling levels, different sampling techniques. So I, I think I've heard you say once in the past, it's like humans need to be out of the loop when it comes to managing that stuff. And I totally agree. Um, but move, moving on, uh, the other thing that we were really uh, proud about and has been really helpful to people, but is not the most novel idea in the world is the Open Telemetry Demo Project. Uh, so this is maybe just like a quick shout out. Uh, this was a, a popular project among people, but we've got um, your, your classic kind of big distributed service uh, web store. Uh, that people can play around with. Um, it includes some feature flags uh, to enable different forms of like problems in the store, like uh, memory leaks and things like that. And it's all instrumented with open telemetry. So people can stand this up, turn on some problems, look at the telemetry coming out in you know whatever tool they're using and kind of get a sense for like how to use open telemetry to solve problems and and if you're just interested in seeing what the open telemetry output looks like in your system, this is a good project to, to yeah, stand up. It is really cool. And the other thing that I liked about it uh, as a project is that it, it attempts to, you know, to have very high coverage of the languages in OTEL as well, right? So it's like, it's yes. not like the whole thing is written in Go or something, right? It's like, oh, using PHP? Well, first of all, I'm sorry, but also, hey, good news, like we have some example code for you, right? So, yeah. um, because that's something that people contend with. It's like, yeah, it's, we want to adopt OTEL and it's no problem in our absolute greenfield stuff, but we also have this other thing that's running over in the side that we need to trace and, and we don't know how to integrate with that. So the OTEL demos, is like a working example of integrating with a very diverse set of um, integration targets. But I think yeah. it's really cool. Yeah, yeah. Actually, a fun side effect of this project is if you're looking to instrument your own services, uh, you can go into the demo project and crack them open. And, and we tried to document it, make it very clear like how we are adding uh, open telemetry to these services. So it's also yeah. a good reference yeah. For people. Yeah, it's sort of like this in some way. I mean, it's not really advertised as such, but it's almost like an integration test for the breadth of OTEL from a, yes. a surface area coverage, like platform standpoint, which I think is is um, is really yeah, super helpful, I think, for pulling like working example code in a heterogeneous system. Yeah, yeah. And um, it the web store sells telescopes, which makes me really is that right? telescope. Yeah, that's what I think. I actually, I didn't actually really go on and like, what is this thing doing? I like played around with it, but I wasn't. I didn't actually receive a telescope in the mail. Is it that doesn't? It doesn't. That, yeah, I think we'll have to um, do some some digging into to why that function is not working. But okay. All right. Anyways, um, speaking of verbosity levels, um, uh, something that has also been kind of kicked off that people were interested about at KubeCon is profiling. There was a lot of interest in, in profiling. Um, uh, there was also interest in eBPF. We'll, we'll talk about an eBPF project uh, in a minute, but um, I was noticing people were kind of like conflating these two things a little hmm. bit really? in their head. That's yeah. Because it's just like low level kernel something something <laughs> you know uh, automated something something. So I'm I'm curious like what what do you think about like profiling and and how it could be useful in a, the context of like distributed observability? Yeah, you know, I I don't mean to sound like a total you know party pooper or something, but the profiling thing kind of freaks me out a little bit, <laughs> uh, uh, and I'll tell you why. So. And also, I noticed we haven't had any questions in the chat. If people are sick of hearing us talk to each other, you can fix that by asking a question in the chat or in the Q and A thing, and we'll, we'll we'll take it as they come. So here's the thing: like when people say profiling, I think what they mean. I mean, knowing what hotel profiling actually does, it's it's like more about um, you know really widespread sort of CPU profiling, which is fine. It's definitely a thing. Um, the other type of profiling that people want to do 
is more like um uh you know critical path analysis uh which you honestly don't need hotel profiling for uh that's just like capture traces automatically analyze critical path and summarize it in some way and there's nothing wrong with profiling it's definitely an important thing and i i mean there is a thing called gwp when i was at google in the 2000s it's called google wide profiling which saved google gobs of money because it allowed you to figure out globally across the state like you know which functions are using the most cpu now the thing is and this is the thing that kind of bugs me about it is and why i feel like a grump it's not that it's not valuable, but it's a way of saving money. It's a way of saving throughput. It really, like doing profiling like this doesn't really help that much for latency at all, especially for tail latency, which is usually what matters. Yeah. And sometimes I feel like people are like, oh, I want to make my stuff faster. I'm going to profile it. And like, sort of um, that, I mean, you are making some, you're making the things that use the most CPU faster by doing this, but that actually is a totally different question than optimizing a critical path. In fact, you may be making it worse in an odd way because sometimes the sorts of optimizations you do to save CPU cycles actually increase tail latency. And so I'm, I'm, whenever people say profile, I'm like, are you sure this is what you want? Like, if you want to make your stuff faster for your end users, this actually literally might make it worse. Um, however, if you're trying to like save on your Amazon bill and reduce CPU usage, this is a, a fantastic project to pursue. Um, sometimes I wonder a little bit cynically whether OTEL is necessarily the right way to be doing this or if it would be better to just have, you know, something like PPROF running, um, you know, continuously in the background. But anyway, I mean, I, I realize it's a little bit unfair the way I'm characterizing it and that it's not, it's not quite that way, but I have a little bit of a trigger around the word profiling because yeah. I think it, people can conflate CPU profiling, latency profiling, and they actually in some ways are opposed to each other. Yeah, I mean, I uh, I can totally see OpAmp and um, distributed tracing instrumentation being a useful trigger for stuff like PPROF. Yeah. Um, my 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 tr trigger around this stuff is like the thing people keep being is like, yeah. So if there's a problem going on, I could like dynamically enable PPROF or this like other stuff, and I'm like. That sounds really great because, you know, re restarting things when there's a problem is bad. You lose data. But on the other hand, like being like, hmm, this machine's acting really weird. Let's like totally increase uh, the workload yeah, on it yeah. and see what happens. So I, I agree. There's there's some some work here. But, you know, the the thing that I've noticed when people are asking about this, you, you're talking about CPU profiling and all this and. I, I swear what a lot of people seem to want, and maybe this is why they get confused with eBPF, which also doesn't do this, is <laughs> just uh, something that's more like like stack traces or just like a, a lower level, uh, higher fidelity uh, kind of information about what their system is doing. So they have like, this operation is failing and now I want more detailed information, but it's not like exactly profiling or, you know, EVPF style, you know, um, hooks. Yeah. Uh, but, but that I've just noticed talking to people at KubeCon that seemed to be in general, maybe the most common thing people wanted. I want more detailed information about this operation sometimes. Yeah. That's a really good point. Yeah. People are, 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 they, they want is a backtrace or maybe even a distributed backtrace. Yeah. And profiling is, uh, technique that requires that, but it can be used for other things <laughs> yeah. as well, like, you know, exception tracking and stuff like that, right? So, yeah. yeah. But we, we do have a profiling working group uh, now, and there are a lot of people from that working group uh, who are at KubeCon. So if anyone in the audience is interested in this stuff, you can join that open telemetry working group and let them know what, what exactly it is uh, you want. Uh, yeah, I think so, it's a fair, yeah, I mean, I'll, my last word on profiling, I will just say is I, I don't want to be, I don't want my, I don't want to seem too grumpy about it. I definitely think it's important. It's just this locus of several different use cases and then several different yes. implementation strategies. And yes. people are coming at this from wanting either the implementation strategy of the backtraces or certain use cases. And then they're all kind of jammed together into this, into this, you know, into this coalition and, and nothing wrong with that. I think it's sort of inevitable, but. Uh, but I just, uh, yeah, I, I, I sometimes I, 
I worry that like it's getting pulled in a lot of different directions, but anyway. Yes, yeah, I, likewise, it's kind of a confusing blob of stuff. Uh, all of it's useful, but it needs, we need to kind of, we need to use more words maybe and kind of tease this stuff apart so that we can have a clearer conversation about it. Yeah. Um, so uh, ho-hum, but on the roadmap and super important, there's uh, more and more uh, Kubernetes uh, level uh, instrumentation and telemetry coming online. I know uh, David Ashpool uh, is working on a lot of this stuff along with a lot of other people. And one thing they announced at KubeCon was kubelet tracing. So for people who don't know, the kubelet is the little controller agent that you run on all of your machines that are uh, running application containers uh, for you. And so it's the thing controlling the kind of container lifecycle. So your Kubernetes scheduler is basically talking to all of these kubelets um, and managing the sort of global state of all of your services. And they've added uh, tracing to, to this component, which includes being able to have tracing around um, the life cycle of your containers. So it seems useful. Yeah, for sure. And it's also just, it's exciting to me because this has been a long time coming. I mean, I remember before open telemetry when we were just doing open tracing, like super early days, like 2016, maybe 2017, no later than that. I can't remember exactly having a conversation about essentially doing this. I mean, uh, like actually instrumenting Kubernetes stack internally. And there was a lot of interest in doing it, but it was just going to be really hard. And then there were just also concerns about, about Kubernetes taking dependencies on anything. It's like it had to be a certain level of maturity and everything. And it's to me, this is just like a, just another pretty big, bright check mark on OTEL uh, from a stability and legitimacy standpoint. Um, and it's taken, as I said, like it's been more than five years since we first started talking about doing this. And, and it's a really important step for the project from a validation standpoint. And then it's also, I think, a really good thing for just overall Kubernetes introspection. So yeah, it's, it's awesome. Yeah. Um, fun fact, this was one of the use cases that got me interested in distributed tracing and open tracing and all of this. I was working on Cloud Foundry, but working on, you know, distributed system schedulers um different scheduling algorithms and you know trying to make sure they actually adhere to what they claim they are doing um and uh it was really annoying to try to do that without some form of distributed tracing and since this needed to get uh this platform was in use by lots and lots of different uh organizations who all wanted to shovel the data somewhere else that uh it's kind of funny that we're finally now getting this for Kubernetes, but this was one of the things that, that got me reading the Dapper paper and, and all this other stuff, because I was trying to implement it for this use case. Oh, huh, interesting. Yeah, cool. fun fact. Okay, uh, super, super boring and super, super on point. Uh, logs, open telemetry logs, at long last becoming stable. Also events, because we decided to put logs and events together. But as a slow clap, that, so that was, that was <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like literally don't know what we can say about this. They're logs, they're structured. That's nice. I actually think it's a, it is a, uh, maybe ho hum, certainly important, certainly on point, but no small achievement, right? Like, I mean, of yeah. the, the part of the reason that we started with tracing, uh, was that it, you know, it was like a gap, um, and needed to get, we needed to get the, the, perp the original impetus like for open telemetry was to fuse open census and open tracing. And part of that was to deprecate them both as soon as possible. So tracing needed to get done quickly. So that was true. But the other reason that tracing was appealing was that because it was so greenfield, we didn't have this messy multiverse of like, you know, um, existing quasi standards to deal with. And in logging, you know, that's, I, I mean, it's just an enormous, enormous issue. And I, um, I do want to applaud our frenemies at Splunk for a lot of the work kind of driving this forward. I think it would have been difficult without some of, you know, their participation. And also, I think it was awesome. Um, a lot of the, you know, Elastic was nice enough to, uh, to yes. you know, donate uh, ECS and stuff like that. But, but it's, it's a, you know, 
it's not difficult at all to imagine standardizing the idea of a log line, like we're going to log something, but then there's this next level of detail of like getting into the semantics and the structure of it. That's really where this gets powerful. And I think actually like the incorporation of logs into OTEL and the semantic conventions has like more to do with the eventual success of like unification efforts around observability than just about anything, right? Because it's yeah. like you can automate the correlations in a principled way between these different flavors of um, statistical and event-based telemetry. And and uh, and I think that this particular milestone is just absolutely critical in achieving that. Um, so it's a big deal, even if it doesn't seem that way and seems ho-hum, I think it allows for observability tooling to do things that people have been asking for for like decades, you know? So I think it's yeah. very exciting. Yeah, and it, it also like finishes our original yes. roadmap. Um, so I'm excited to get this thing done because it means we can now move on to, um, for one, convenience. Like you said, it's a, it can be like our, our real goal is not just to like make it all work and stable, but to make it make it easy for people to stand up and, and use so it can get in everywhere. So yeah, we can um, kind of go up the stack. And it also means that like coordination at this level is so difficult, right? Because it's like you need to have a lot of collaboration and buy-in from people who aren't like at cross purposes exactly, but they do have different needs. And it's just, yeah, just consensus is hard, especially in open source. Um, but I think yeah. having consensus at this level allows for a more parallelization of the development effort for yeah. hotel as well, uh, which is just welcome, I think, from a velocity yeah. standpoint. The, the, I will say defining like a, a standardized log format was um, way less fraught than defining the metrics. Uh, yeah, why do you think that is? I, I don't. I don't disagree. Why do you? Why do you think that is? So I two reasons. One, uh, the the metrics issues. Some of them are are just like like genuinely difficult, tricky nonsense. Like like stuff around like heuristics around um, things like histograms where you just have like off Y1 errors with your bucketing and just these like very subtle distinctions between the different uh, various metric systems that are out there that are mathematically incompatible with each other. You know, that, uh, that adds a huge amount of complexity. You have this like a uh, push versus pull concept in in metrics which again like like both approaches are fine but it's the tabs want... versus spaces of observability basically. yes exactly and we're like fine we'll do both but that actually is like like a big do extra dollop of implementation complexity so and, and on the log side um yes there are different standards but also it's like all the um logging companies and backends, they're so used to just getting a fire hose of absolute crap sent to them, you know, just like just blobs of strings that they have to parse. And like, it's almost like they're just like, uh, yeah, as long as it's structured somehow, we we don't care. Like, yeah, just... I, I, think, <laughs> I think that's all correct. And the other thing I would say about metrics that I think make them particularly difficult is that I'll try to be brief about this, but metrics are all trying to encode some kind of query. Uh, uh, and then you're actually, you're, the metric itself is like the output of a query, even if the most basic example would be like a counter. Um, yes. Like you're doing, essentially you're doing like a, a, a group by sum <laughs> query mm -hmm. in a streaming fashion in your code. And so you're counting how many times something happened. Okay, fine. Yes. It gets harder though when you're dealing with a query like a distribution query, which results in like a histogram output. And so like the, the metric is doing some kind of partial computation and then the rest of the computation happens later on in some other system. And I think the reason that people have so much difficulty in, in collaborating or no, sorry, it's not the right word, in achieving consensus around representations and stuff like that is that the query models actually kind of break if you change those representations. Whereas I think for logging data, um, it's like you said, uh, first of all, yeah. yeah, totally. Like people are, are people implementing logging systems are already dealing with an incredibly messy brownfield of heterogeneous data. So they're used to it, but also the data is basically event oriented, right? It's like, it's much less common 
um, to to see logs that are encoding the output of queries. Like they're more like the input to queries. Yes. So you don't have this additional level of like people aren't thinking about it this way when they're debating these things. But for metrics, we're really debating we're debating the internal representation of a complex streaming query that's like midstream. So like no wonder that's a mess because like it breaks the, <laughs> it breaks the computation if you change the representation yeah. in a way that yeah. doesn't really happen with logs. I think. Yeah, it the it see, really seems like the fundamental axiomatic building blocks of metrics are more complicated than logging. Logging is just like here is an event of some kind, and as a telemetry system, we don't care what you do with it. But with metrics, like we can't get out of caring about what what the function of this thing is, and that's that's in a world where people have been inventing functions for like 20 years, 30 years, you know, longer, like it's, it's messy. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, moving on, we got, I think maybe two more items on our list. So now we're getting into the things that are like not on the open telemetry roadmap at all, but actually like interesting to the project. And one of them, uh, speaking of eBPF, is the Cilium project. So this is a new project that's been added to the CNCF uh, focus on eBPF. Um, I should add, this is not an observability project. This is this is more of a, a efficient networking um, proxy kind of project that's really leveraging the fact that eBPF is a low level language for programming the kernel. So it's an efficient way to program your networking stack. But a side effect of that is you can use it for, um, you know, low level network observability. So I'm not sure how much you followed this project or similar projects, Ben, but what are your thoughts on this? Well, um, I followed it in the sense that I've like read the GitHub read me and stuff you know i've never tried to implement it or use it in a meaningful way so i certainly don't want to be wrong uh about anything i would say i um i i like a lot of things about this approach um uh to using ebpf my critique of ebpf based observability stuff in the past which you've heard before ted is is just that it you know a lot, but not all observability efforts are trying to bridge into the application layer. Uh, oh, sorry, stepping back. The nice, the best thing about eBPF is that you can integrate with it at the kernel. So assuming everything's on Linux at some level, great. Like you have this integration point that will give you total coverage of everything happening in your containers or VMs or whatever. And that that's very appealing for sure. And I think, you know, coverage with observability and telemetry stuff in general is a huge, huge problem. And eBPF addresses the coverage issue in this fundamental, inarguable, very elegant way. So like, great, check plus. Now the trouble with eBPF is that a lot of observability efforts don't really actually work, at least in a full stack way, unless they go into the application layer. And if you're stuck in the kernel, that's really tough, especially given that most point-to-point -point communication is encrypted. So at the kernel level, it's just a bunch of just random noise. Like there's no way to get you know layer seven data out if you're at eBPF, especially with the move towards you know TLS everywhere and stuff like that. So that's usually been my critique. The thing I like about Cilium is that you know, I mean it it is a bit more monolithic than say open telemetry, right? Like it goes up the stack into delivering actual value props and stuff. Like it's not just about gathering data, but a lot of the value props it's delivering actually do make a lot of sense with eBPF level data. Um, I would be very, very surprised if you could use Cilium to completely replace, you know, uh, application level distributed tracing thing that you have, whatever that is like, because again, the application level is sort of missing. And that's been my critique of having eBPF as like, the be all end all to the open telemetry problem because open telemetry yeah. has a lot of focus on application layer stuff. I do think that Cilium has like an incredible insertion uh, motion of just being you know in the VM. Uh, and then I also think that Cilium can solve for a lot of important use cases in a really encapsulated simple way. The trouble with it is that it's never going to be the only solution, right? Not like you yeah. know most complex enterprises can have one solution for stuff like this, but it's always going to run into a pretty hard brick wall, I think, when it comes to application layer stuff. And that's just the 
that's the thing I've never really gotten around with EPPF. I've seen a lot of people talk about it, but I've just never seen it done. So yeah, um, I know that they say it's L7 protocol aware, but I think what they mean by that is uh, that it can it can like do point to point stuff at the L7 layer, but you still can't really inspect the application protocol at L7. And, and that's where it really would get powerful. If they can solve yeah. that problem, it would be amazing. So. Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of like the same issue with, I mean, it, well, it's literally the same issue with service mesh observability, right? Yes, yes. Well, I mean, that's, well, I think actually service mesh has a little bit of an advantage because um, it is possible the service mesh to be like post TLS. You still have this problem of like, you can't use service mesh to handle inbound to outbound propagation within, yes. a, within a process. So it's analogous to service mesh, but at least service mesh, I think, has the advantage of of being able to potentially see inside the yeah. decrypted packets. So. so, yeah, so actually my one fun update on this, I was talking to the Cilium people about this, this issue mm -hmm. and they were proposing, uh, there are two potential workarounds around, you know, TLS encryption. One, of course, is you just give Cilium certs <laughs> and, you know, it can dig in there. Um, you know, there's some overhead with that. Uh, the more interesting future looking um, solution here is actually with uh, the newest versions of Linux. Uh, they have, um, there has been a kernel level TLS project within mm -hmm. Linux. So moving TLS down into the kernel, which uh, one, uh, efficiency gains, but two, it means that this EBPF approach, like it becomes a lot more feasible now to to be doing this kind of stuff uh so that's not available uh, yet from what i understand but that that's kind of like on the roadmap well til i mean that that's great <laughs> uh honestly and that's i didn't know that i'll just be honest that's cool um i yeah i think that uh there's still a lot to be done to go from that tls level thing to like the fully demangled kind of HTTP stuff, but it's at least feasible, right? It's not like you're trying to like solve some sort of unsolvable math problem anymore. Um, and I like the idea of moving TLS down the stack anyway, because I think we're having trouble. CPUs can't keep up the network anymore. So this probably also opens the door to pushing that stuff down to the NIC, which um, would be really helpful. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, very exciting. Um, not available yet, <laughs> from what I understand. Yeah, oh, cool. Cool. Uh, okay, so I think we're on to our, our last item here. So again, yeah, if uh, there aren't questions in the Q&A yet, uh, consider queuing them up. Um, but uh, um, another project, a CNCF project within this space is FluentBit. Uh, FluentBit is the C++ implementation of the FluentD um, protocol. It's, uh, for people who don't know, it's uh, a uh, originally started as kind of like a logging processor, um, but with V2, they have done two things. One, they have improved the efficiency uh, and overhead of FluentBit. And the other thing they have done is they have expanded beyond logging to also processing metrics and tracing, including OTLP, the open telemetry protocol, uh, which also makes... Uh, the fluent bit daemon look an awful, awful lot like the open telemetry collector. Um, I actually think this is fine and great, but uh, I'm curious how how you see this um, observability landscape unfolding. Yeah, I'm net positive on this existing. Um, it is a little problematic in that, you know, it's just, I don't know, whatever. It, it, for end users, I think it... it makes it a little bit less obvious what to do. But um, overall, I mean, you've heard me say this a million times, Ted, but I'll just repeat, like, I think it's extremely important for OTEL to remain decoupled. And the collector is a very popular and important aspect of open telemetry, which I'm certainly like enthusiastic about at this point. Like, I think it's good, but um, I worry sometimes that it's become such a dumping ground for, for like, just like things that could happen at that layer that it, it runs the risk of like breaking some of the decoupling in ways that people wouldn't even notice because everyone's using the mm -hmm. collector. So I like yes. the idea of people pushing on 
alternatives to the hotel collector just to kind of keep hotel honest actually about maintaining decoupling right so i think um especially if you know i my understanding is fluent that v2 has a lot of um hotel kind of compatibility uh and there's like otlp support in various places and stuff like that so it's a good test i think of hotels sort of resiliency from a uh from a um from a design standpoint that something like fluent bit v2 can succeed and be and and you know and just work harmoniously with other parts of the hotel ecosystem so like from that standpoint i think it's great um like whether someone should use that or hotel collector is kind of up to them i mean i, I that's not it's important to me but i actually think it's really helpful to have projects like this exist it is certainly off-road for hotel like i don't as you know, have it here but that's not to to say that i think it's a bad idea it's just like it's it's sort of helpfully divergent from the hotel way of doing things which would be the collector I guess put another way, I find it very hard to believe that you'd want to run Hotel Collector and Fluent Bit V2 in the same kind of, you know, like in the same environment, like that seems like they're sort of cross purposes. Um, and that's fine. Uh, but yeah, it, it is off road in that sense. But it's like helpful for the project as a as a check and a balance, I think. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I see this as, you know, for people who are in the, the Fluent ecosystem, this means they they can kind of stand pat and just upgrade what they're currently doing and start gaining all the advantages of a collector without having to to switch. So I, I think it's great. And I think you had a great point about open keeping open telemetry honest. I haven't seen a step in this bear trap yet, but I do worry like you that if we start assuming that everyone using hotel is running a collector or that it's like no big deal to go to people and be like, just run the collector. Um, that uh, we we are going to create a, a problem for ourselves and for people. Uh, we haven't we haven't actually crossed that Rubicon yet, but I think having a good chunk of the open telemetry community using an alternative uh, to the collector, um is is good here um i i also see it as kind of like this like go versus c plus plus thing you know at the end of the day you want you yeah. want this component to be as efficient as possible and like we write everything in go but i i will be like a a secret i don't know um uh, contrarian <laughs> this is a recorded and call ted <laughs> I will I will go on the record and say like go is great but like are we going to hit some wall at some point uh where we're going to wish that this component was in C++ or, or Rust or something yeah. where you aren't fighting a garbage collector having had to having written a lot of go code <laughs> yeah I think that's completely valid and I mean yeah I was going to say Rust but you said it first I mean that yeah. also seems like a yeah uh if you're trying to avoid um the pitfalls of go but don't want to like run into the just monstrous <laughs> c plus plus sort of anyway um i see that there's a question hi will there be a recording sent yes 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 there will and it will be on the youtubes so you can watch it there too cool yeah Other well more yeah, we're at the top of the the or the bottom of the hour. We're somewhere near the hour, um, and uh, this is our our last item on our uh, KubeCon review. So it's time for questions, or it's time to say aloha. Does aloha mean hello and goodbye, Ted? Hello, goodbye. I love you, man. It, it's just a a really warm, fuzzy, general <laughs> purpose word. Okay. That's good to know. Ted's from Hawaii, so yeah, we can ask him questions about Hawaii as well. Yeah. Aloha is like a concept. It's like my aloha. Like I have aloha. Oh. It's almost like a, a mana kind of thing. Is that right? Like, I yeah, I'm that. giving you my aloha. It's like a, a feeling, but like feelings are also like an, an energy oh. you know you can share it's with like people. Chi or something. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um I was killing time to see if anyone was gonna ask any questions. Questions. I'm disturbed when people don't ask any questions, uh, as I'm sure that people disagreed with something we were saying, but it's fine. Um, yeah. I'm just being quiet. 
whole beings. Well, it seems like we're good. So perhaps we should just sign off. Let's yeah. see, uh, do you have any par parting thoughts, Ben? Like, uh, I will just say that, you know, I, we didn't mention it, but it was really nice that KubeCon actually like happened. Uh, it, you know, uh, it's been a long three years, yes, almost yes. three years at this point. I know that KubeCon kind of happened before, but this one seemed like the get veering back towards normality at some level. And uh, and it's also really nice that Otel has kind of gotten to the point that it is. I, the thing in the bottom right is critical, as you said as well. But you know, we announced Otel at KubeCon EMEA in 2019. Uh, or KubeCon EU, whatever, uh, the one in, in Copenhagen or something. Yeah. I don't even remember what it was. But um, uh, it's been a long time getting to this point, and it's just, it's really satisfying to have made it to that uh, milestone. And, and now it's just all about ease of use and scope. And I mean, it's just an, it's an exciting time for an exciting project with a lot of things going on as evidenced by, you know, this slide and everything else. So yeah, I, I, I feel good about stuff. Um, if people have other questions, you know, please reach out to Ted or I on, on uh, Elon Musk's personal Twitter. <laughs> Thumbs down. Uh, yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's, um, I hope this is useful for people. Yeah, I'm, I'm moving back to AOL chat at this point. <laughs> Over it. Uh, yeah, well, always great talking, Ben. And yeah, we'll be doing open telemetry community days at every KubeCon, hopefully, going forward. So, everyone, hope to see you there. Thank you so much, Ben and Ted, for your time today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day.